we have some core values people need to stick to those core, core values uh, you know does the employee to the you know got it want it and can they take on more capacity to to execute it i think what people are not using is the cbo and the optimization techniques that facebook's actually teaching you uh, you know uh, stories is uh, stories is like another version of it which is basically like so much inventory is open up on facebook stories and all the money that i had at that point in time like let's say about $4000 for all thrown on facebook ads right and we just waited and then of course the first sale came in the same day at about within 2 hours of launching the ad if we have somebody who is say uh, like a high school student right and we and if this popular high school student has about 15000 followers we'll give them a watch and we'll send them two watches for free and we'll say look give them to anyone in your circle who you think you know what what uh, uh what represents the values of the brand mm-hmm. and and you, as you know high school students are pretty viral right they look they are very aspirational so they look up to like oh this person has a brand new award who else wants a brand new award and that is coming up next on bootstrapping your dreams show so stay tuned so the big question is this how are ambitious people like us who don't have a lot of resources did not go to ivy league colleges were not born into wealth how do we become resourceful enough use our creativity our dedication and a little bit of crazy to bootstrap our way to realizing our dreams whether it is launching a new company launching a new app or making it to the top of the corporate ladder that is the question and this podcast will give you the answers We have created a tremendous community of bootstrappers, entrepreneurs and professionals who are ambitious, resourceful and want to get things done. We brainstorm, support and help each other out. So come join us. Navigate to bootstrapping.group, join today and get the Startup Founders Technology Accelerator video series absolutely free. If you enjoy this video then do let us know by hitting that like button now. Or if you want us to improve our content then go ahead and hit that thumbs down button and give us your honest feedback in the comment section below here at tatter noodle we are passionate about entrepreneurship technology and innovation every week we bring you insightful and engaging videos interviews tips tricks and strategies to help you grow your business or rise in your corporate profession if you're new here please do consider subscribing and do not forget to hit that bell icon so that you are notified when we publish new content hello and welcome to this new episode of bootstrapping your dreams show i'm your host manoj agarwal and today we'll be talking with roni teja roni works with a 100 person remote team of over 10 people and his main business is in vancouver canada where i am located as well uh, he started brandio with an inspiration to provide men and women with quality watches for a good price with the best service possible and his focus is primarily men's fashion watches which are made with the best quality materials and these watches are designed in Vancouver and manufactured in China uh Ronnie immigrated to Canada 12 years ago and he jumped into auto- entrepreneurship about 5 years ago taught himself uh, multiple languages um selling radio ads door to door worked with HSBC Best Buy Target Australia before starting his own business welcome Ronnie Hey yo. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about your story. You are an immigrant. Uh, I am an immigrant myself. So uh, every immigrant has uh, you know a unique story. Uh, some of it uh, are very similar. Uh, some of them are very similar, but I'd love to know your unique immigrant story first before we dive in. Ah, uh, I think I landed in Vancouver on May the 14th, uh, 2006. I'm sure we nobody forgets the date when they actually landed into Canada or mm-hmm. the US or wherever they did. So May the May the fourteenth, I landed. Uh, two days later, uh, through through some family friends who knew uh, this uh, person who owned a radio station, they said, "Hey, look, there's this job available. Uh, you know, you're not going to do much sitting around. We might as well put you put you to work immediately." So basically, I went I went door to door selling uh, radio ads. Uh, I didn't I didn't I, I didn't know much Punjabi because when I was born in India, I grew up in Mumbai and a couple of other places, so the language is quite different for me. But uh, so basically. Uh, and i didn't have a car so what i would do is i would wake up at about 7 o'clock catch the bus go to work get all my appointments set for the day and then i would take another bus i got travel in an hour and basically start in all the the strip malls so i would go to the indian part of town the indian strip malls and basically go uh, door to door selling radio ads so i did that for a couple of years uh, till basically i said look i think i'm done with this i want to i want to move on to be in a pastures 
but yeah, it was an interesting experience. You know, uh, it taught you. It taught uh, sales is always important. It teaches you the the value of saying, uh, you know, uh, of not hearing the word no, and actually being pretty uh, consistent with you know hearing, uh, you know, how to how to, how to deal with failure. Right. That 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 was a major learning out of it. Another thing that I found that was quite uh, quite interesting was, uh, you know, how how different cultures do businesses very differently. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, for example, for Asia. Uh, we live in we live in the very short run. Our mm-hmm. short run leeway is probably like a year, uh, not even a year. That's that's making it too long. The people here, you, people from our part of the world, mostly look look into immediate. You know what? How, how can I make money? How can I make it quick? And you know, I don't care. Uh, I don't care if anything after that. Whereas the Western perspective, which I found was quite different when it came to sales or it came to any sort of doing business. I mean, people people in uh, you know North America look at doing business from five, ten, fifteen, twenty years from now. I mean, that's not just North America. I mean. Uh, countries which uh, which I guess I guess are a bit more developed. I don't know how to use that term, uh, but yeah. So that, that there, was, there was a different mindset. There was a different in how people did sales. There was a different in you know uh, not everything was price driven. So coming from India, and I'm sure you would agree with me, my friend, is the fact that everything is up for everything is up for sale, and everything is basically like uh, is basically what is the lowest price? I'll give you the lowest price, and that's pretty much it. There's no office sales service. They don't care about anything after that. There's no such follow up with uh, with a customer about hey. You know, uh, if I, you know, if I'm selling a watch today, I'm not selling a watch just for the short term. I'm selling a watch that is two, three, four years from now because uh, within within the sales of the watch, uh, I have captured a two to three year warranty, right, for the customer. If at any point of time the customer has issues with buying this watch in the next three years, they're welcome to email us up, email us. They get a free, they get a free replacement, right? Uh, of course, customer reviews matter the most. Do you want to see your brand being featured uh, online with uh, saying this is the worst uh, quality product with the worst, uh, you know, who don't, who, who, whose customer service is bad? I mean, that, that's basically a barrier of entry, especially for a D2C brand that we're trying to build. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Not, yeah, I mean, price sensitivity is uh, applicable to all markets, but I know what you're talking about. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's a huge, huge factor in, um, in developing countries for sure. And, and I guess the reason is because people don't have you know, a whole lot of money. So, so they have to make do with what they have. And, and that's the reason why, you know, everybody's looking to save some money rather than look at the quality and whatnot. Right. Yeah. I mean, service at the end, at the end of it, I mean, if whatever we look at it, right. So for a good example of this is you go buy like a $1 cable from AliExpress or you're buying something on there without any, uh, you know, first of all, like, uh, you know, the time of fulfillment, to your doorstep is going to be about two to three months, right? Mm-hmm. You, you finish that off. And then after that, you know, um, this cable may or may not work on top of it. So, I mean, you, you're going to pay what you get for at the end of the day. So it's up to, it's up to the customer. I'm not saying it's not a bad idea, but it's like, but in some cases it ends up being penny wise and pound foolish. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So uh, how did you decide to uh, leave your job? Like, did you, uh, you went into another job after that? Yeah. 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 So I was working for a small e-commerce firm here in Vancouver. And, you know, uh, one fine day, December, December the 1st, I got a call from them saying, hey, we're going to downsize. And would you be, you know, would you be interested in, you know, taking the handshake? I said, yeah, sure. I'll take the cold handshake. No problem. My 30th birthday was just coming up back then. And I said, look, uh, it's a good time for me to, to, to decide if I want to take a chance on myself. Right. Uh, I was lucky enough that, you know, I had enough money to go and pay for a trip to Japan. I had a nice birthday in Japan in February. Uh, and then guess what? Uh, while, while, while uh, skiing in Japan, I realized, oh, wait a second, I need to take a chance on myself. I've been making other people money my whole life. And I said, why, why don't I deserve the opportunity, the chance to say, hey, I, Ronnie, am, I'm doing this for the people, but you know, I owe it to myself at least once in my life uh, to, uh, to, take it, to take it one step forward. Right, mm-hmm. and that's so. That's where the inspiration began. I mean, I had a I had an interview with a with a pretty big local retailer uh, uh, to head their uh, the de- web development team uh, called Mech. And basically, one of the things that actually ended up uh, with the feedback from the interview, from what I heard from them, was they said that I'm a flight risk because because of course I'd worked in digital marketing and I was used to changing my job every two years, which is actually the average for all digital marketing jobs to engage customers and everything else. So uh, you know, I. Maybe I took it to heart, maybe I didn't take it to heart, but I mean, whatever we look at it, I said, you know, I owe it to myself to take a chance on myself. So that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's how we started. I mean, I'm sure you've had guests on the show who basically have started in a similar fashion. Yeah. Right? yeah. I did. Yeah. yeah. 
I didn't hone in on watches in the first place, to be honest with you. It wasn't watches. It was, uh, I wanted to start my own digital marketing agency. And then we basically worked, worked out from that. So let's talk about that. Uh, that's what uh, I wanted to dig in uh, uh, as well. Like, describe to me your first steps. Like, how did you, uh, how did you get into entrepreneurship? What was those first experiences? What, what kind of challenges did you face initially? Well, yeah. Look, uh, first of all, uh, there is no book on entrepreneurship. Nobody's going to give you that. There's no guide or there's no Bible to it. It's like you can, you can, you can try and, uh, you can try and like dig into other people's experiences, uh, which I, which you know, I had, and I had some people who were new entrepreneurs, and you could dig into that. But to hone into like, so uh, I had, I, I started working for a, a couple of clients. You know, it was going well, and I said, look, wait a second, I'm not really passionate about this. There, I, this, the values that I have when I started my entrepreneurship journey did not really resonate with what I was doing in the long term, right? Mm -hmm. So I think to have that, uh, if you were starting entrepreneurship journey tomorrow, I think to sit down and ask yourself <coughs> why I'm doing this and what is the reason, uh, what, are, what are my core values that I have and why I want to uh, sort of do this, take this big step in my life. I believe those, those are the things one should ask themselves before they get in. And for mm -hmm. me at that point in time, I had, uh, I'd come across a very stylish gentleman who was wearing a, a Daniel Wellington watch. And I said, how cool would it be to manufacture those watches myself. And I did some research into it and I looked at, okay, there's another brand called Movement Watches and they, you know, then came Komono and all these guys I said, wait a second, I can, I can do what they're doing, but why can't I do it? So well, I hired a designer here in Vancouver, uh, started working with them. Turns out six months in and uh, through the whole process of manufacturing in China, if you're not there on the ground, you're not really going to get much done. And every time they're going to charge you for a new mold, they're going to charge you for uh, a new product. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to find ways uh, you know, when the manufacturing process starts and I don't have the manufacturing experience, you know, we just, uh, coming from a marketing background, I would say, I need a watch that looks like this. I didn't give them the dial. I didn't give them the spec. I didn't give them what sort of things I needed. So that was my biggest failure in the start, right? But then what I found out was the world's largest uh, watch fair happens in Hong Kong. And six months in, uh, I think I only had about $5,000 left. So I booked myself a one-way ticket to go to Hong Kong. And I said, and I started meeting with all the watch manufacturers of China, all under one roof, mm. right? I sat down with them and I said, look, this is what I'm trying to do. These are the time of credit terms that I need. And because uh, uh, most, most of China, uh, I don't know if you know, it's like 30% upfront and 70% on delivery, right? To take it even one step further is the fact that uh, I'm, I'm a new guy. So nobody's going to, because the kind of credit terms I'm looking for is 30, 30, 50, uh, 30, 50, 20. The so 30% upfront. 50%, you know, net 60 and 20%, you know, net 90. Unheard of before. So I started finding out the right partners whom we can work with, right? Uh, and going through the process, you know, of course, meeting people's families and everything else. This is where the Asian uh, part of, uh, you know, growing up in Asia actually helps a lot. Because you're not talking to the person to do business with directly. You're talking to the families. You're talking to the employees. You're talking to the bosses. You're talking to seeing how, well, how good of a fit it is to work in that sort of mentality. So I thought, I thought it was quite interesting in that sense. Uh, and then finally, we, we, uh, we zeroed in on a watch manufacturer who gave, who gave us, who took a chance of me uh, more than anything else. And it's worked out for us in the long run for the last five years. Nice, very cool. Um, let me ask you one thing. Why did you go into something that you didn't know much about? I mean, I, I'm just assuming here because from your uh, description, you came from digital marketing. So did you have yeah. any... Uh, prior history experience with watches or how did that come about? Uh, so, uh, so basically I had a friend of mine who, who'd done the marketing for movement watches before and he would actually said, Hey, look, this is a really solid product, right? It's like these guys, and, and this is in 2012, 2013. And I remember him just mentioning it somewhere saying, Oh, look, the CP on the watches back then Facebook ads were like 13, 14 dollars. And they're like, look, why aren't you trying this? It's a, it's a pretty, uh, the margins on watches are pretty good. Compared to that, take, take it one step further. Uh, what we if, what we found out was it's a uh, the the sleek the sleek men's watch industry was very well underserved, right? So that's why like coming from Vancouver and especially where we both live, it's like you know you can be a, we uh, we can go from the from the city to the mountains in less than one hour, right? You could be you could be doing yoga and you could be skiing in the same day. You could be playing golf. You could be you know on the uh, on the slopes and you could be uh, on the yacht within the same day. So I said, why isn't, there the, why isn't the market being served with a versatile watch uh, like this? So that was the thought process behind it. And that's why, and plus, of course, 
like I said, the margins on what is uh, the thought process definitely helped up on that. Okay, awesome. And so, um, watch is, uh, you know, when, when somebody thinks about starting a business, watch obviously, uh, it may not come to mind just because there's a perceived, uh, perceived uh, notion that, you know, multiple notions. One is that uh, watches are dying. Um, you know, people are using cell phones and things like that. Uh, second one could be that, um, you know, there's a huge competition from, um, from other manufacturers. And the third one is, you know, even if people are fond of uh, wearing watches, they are wearing smart watches these days. So with all this in place, like, how, like, did you do any market research? How did you go into this, you know, or did you just say, okay, you know, Let's just do it. I'm going to trust my friend, take his word on it, and just let's just do it and see. Well, wow. yeah, I, I wish I had a scientific way of saying, yes, I did all the things you said. But mm -hmm. to be frankly, frankly, I just went with my gut. I just, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a gut call sort of a guy. And it served me well so far in the business. But it's not going to serve me much, much well in the long term. But what mm -hmm. you're saying, so there was research on about three things. The, the, brand, the brand name that we chose, right? We did some Google service to find out exactly what, what brand name resonates with people the most. Uh, we did another one, which was around what sort of model, models of watches we need. So we went to our competitors and saw what watch dials, watch faces, straps, models sold the most for them. And we focused on only three of them, right? So we said, okay, these are the best sellers. We should focus on, on something similar to this or a variation of this. Not that we dripped them or ripped them off. And the third thing we did was we actually went out to say, look, the watch market is, of course, the, there's a niche for everything, right? Like you were talking about smartwatches, fit, and back then Fitbits were bigger, and all this kind of stuff. So we said, look, all these people uh, who are coming out of university, right, and are getting into their first job, uh, or, you know, the, the young male between uh, 22 to 35, right, they're not wearing watches. However, a watch is a sleek and stylish piece that people should be wearing. I mean, wearing a watch is like, uh, for, for, for us, became a secondary. The, 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 the emotions that a watch, what, what wearing a watch inspires you or inspires you for is basically, uh, you know, this person is, is stylish, right? This person is, you know, uh, is sleek. So those are the kind of emotions we want to invoke when a person wanted to wear. So those are the, that's most of the market research we did. But as you can see, I mean, I tried to sit here in Vancouver, try and manufacturing a watch. It's never worked out for me in the long run. Mm -hmm. I had to go to ground in China to actually find out how it was done. I see. I see. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you found your manufacturer and you had early hiccups and everything. Uh, then what happened? Like, did you have a smooth ride with the new manufacturer? Did you have to go to China? Uh, you were left with $5,000. What happened? So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper on the next step. Now. What yeah, sure. I mean, of course, like I said, the credit really helped. Like when I was looking for a manufacturer, I was asking them to, to go to an untested guy and to, to, look, to look for credit, right? So the guy, the guy basically agreed in principle to give me the credit. So our first round of watches that we did, we actually met, we spent all the money that we had was straight up on Facebook ads. And all of a sudden what we started, we did a small run. Man, so one of, the, one of the criteria for us to do uh, the watches was also a, a small batch manufacturing process, mm -hmm. right? So the MOQ would only be 100 pieces, mm -hmm. right? Not more than 100 pieces. So that actually, that was agreeable to them. The credit terms were agreeable to them. So then whatever we actually started uh, we did it. We did some very basic creative, got the pictures done, and we actually like threw all the ads on Facebook. All the money that I had at that point in time, like let's say about four thousand dollars, were all thrown on Facebook ads, right? Okay. And we just waited. And then of course, the first sale came in the same day, at about within two hours of launching the ad. Wow, nice. So that's when I knew we have a good, we have a sticky product, right? Nice. And then whatever money we were making, we were just reinvesting. We didn't even have the product in hand. To be honest with you, the product was about two weeks away. So when the, when the, when the people uh, started purchasing the product, we told them that, you know, look, we're about two weeks out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bit of a discount if you can just wait till this watch gets to you. Cool. Right? Awesome. And, it, and it actually worked out for them. So now let me tell, uh, ask you about um, a consumer product. Like what kind of uh, service do you provide? How did you set it up? How did you... Like, did you know that what kind of level of service you will need to provide? Did you provision for all that? Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Well, initially, I had not provisioned for anything because I was uh, the business owner. I was customer care. I was a manufacturing head. I was a designer, 
and I was also the marketing guy. And you know, when you start your entrepreneurship journey, it's all going to be all in the same. It's all going to be you who's doing it, right? About three months in, I burnt out. I burnt out really, really, really badly because I think I was going to sleep at, you know, go to sleep at like 3 a.m. servicing customers, and I'd wake up again at like 8 a.m. Uh, with no time to go to the gym, just wake up, hit the laptop, start doing the whole process again. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I hadn't provisioned for it, right? But then somehow during that whole process, I found out that you could be hiring BAs abroad. You could be hiring customer service abroad to actually help you out with that. And so my, I went to an old college roommate of mine and he actually helped me out with this whole process to say, hey, look, I, you know, we know a couple of people here. If you want to help out, I'll, I'll actually like uh, give you help with these BAs. And of course, I didn't know how to train them. I didn't know how to... Uh, go through the whole process of creating SOPs. I didn't know the, I didn't know any of that stuff, man. So it's like, you know, to be to be completely honest with you, uh, there is no like that's what I meant when I said there's no book about it. So when I when I tell you about the, all these experiences of like starting out with being a generalist, right, and then afterwards from being a generalist to actually going to level two, which is basically, hey, uh, I I I I've learned how to delegate, right, and from the delegation process. To where we are now is completely different. The third aspect of where we are is where I'm where I'm working on EOS, right? Which is we're creating an entrepreneurial system in the organization. We have some core values. People need to stick to those core, core values. Uh, you know, does the employee do the you know got it, want it, and can they take on more capacity to to execute it? So we've we've come quite quite a far you know uh, long journey and quite far in terms of what where we, where I started to where we have a large organization now. Cool. Um, what about things like warranty? Because uh, I, I understand, you know, uh, in terms of customer support, answering questions and all that, you can hire VAs. But in a, in a, in a consumer uh, physical product, you have to worry about warranty, you have to worry about spare parts, you have to worry about inventory. Uh, how did you tackle all that? Well, when a, when a customer buys from us, they actually get a, uh, every, all of our watch are uh, they're serial coded. So whenever you want to get warranty, you actually go onto the website and you sign up for your warranty. So we actually know when a, per, when a person has purchased a watch and we know that some of our watches, they will be like some batches will have some manufacturing faults. And if they do, then we know X, Y, Z will have an X amount of time to last. And then of course, in some cases we are proactive. We just send them a new watch even without them complaining to us. No, no. So instead, I mean to say, how yeah. did you come up with that process? Did you have it all oh. planned out? Um, I, I honestly, we looked at we looked at the uh, we looked at uh, movement. We looked at DW. We saw what our competitors did, and we offered them the same warranty. In fact, we went one better. They were offering back then uh, one year warranty, and we said we'll offer two year warranties. Okay, it's a good conversion you, metric. Did you try it? Uh, like, did you did you know that your watches will last two hour or two years? Or we we, we knew our watch is going to last about a year and a half. Okay. okay, like basically, the manufacturer said. Your, our watches will last one, one and a half to two years. And we said so, we'll take it to the maximum. Okay. But the, isn't that a, quite a bit of risk? Like if, if everybody wants, uh, let's say if most watches uh, last one and a half years and you'll be liable for the warranty now, no? Well, yeah, that's fine. I mean, if we can send you a new watch and the, the cost of the watch will still cover the warranty. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, Remember I talked about margins? We, we yeah, bake yeah. that into a margin. So when you buy a watch from us, We've already baked into our margins that if we were to ever send you a replacement watch, that's already baked into it. Yeah. Okay. So we, we've smart. already we've already thought about that process earlier. So if awesome. you, I mean, every manufacturer has, right? You have. So well, we've already I, thought about. Yeah. I, I I don't know, and that is why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Of course. Yeah. So whenever we've costed our products out, we've always incurred the cost of actually the replacement within. It's already baked in. Everything's already baked in. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And um. What about like you never repair anything? So like, do you have any challenges with uh, inventory, like storing inventory for spare parts and stuff? Or? Uh, we usually we don't. You know, uh, we do have some uh, some cases where I can name at the top of my head. People are like, my chrono is broken. Uh, my watch glass got scratched or my watch uh, case got broken. The date and dial doesn't work. We just send them a new watch. I see. I see. Yeah, That's it's just great. it's just honestly, it's uh, a lot easier and a lot less hassle. Mm -hmm. And the customer experience is much more seamless, mm -hmm. and you have a good representation of what the brand is when you do that versus when you nickel and dime your customers. We are not in the business of nickel diming your customers. We don't nickel and dime our customers at all. If it comes down to even us, I mean, in some cases we've taken losses on some customers' orders, and I'm okay with that. Our mentality is we're not here for the short run. We 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 are going to be a brand. We're going to build ourselves up for the next 10, 20 years, and we're going to sell, right? Okay. But the process of when we sell. It's going to be that everybody in the market knows that Brandsy watches are high quality watches. 
They have a good, great customer service uh, team. And no matter what happens, they will always stand by their product. Cool. And, yeah. um, and uh, uh, what about uh, your sales channel? So, you know, uh, you mentioned Facebook ads. Um, how, are you, how are you dealing with that? Like, is it still Facebook ads or you have new sales channels? Uh, well, face, Facebook for sure. Facebook any day. I mean, people keep saying Facebook's getting more expensive. But I think what people are not, are not using is the CBO and the optimization techniques that Facebook's actually teaching you. Uh, you know, uh, stories is uh, stories is like another version of it, which is basically like so much inventory is open up on Facebook stories and Instagram stories that more and more people should be gravitating towards it, but not a lot of people do. They're sticking to the tried and tested methods, you know, promoted posts or promoted uh, channels. Mm -hmm. uh, TikTok is a good one, right? If you if you're trying out something, but depends on the product, right? At the end of the day, for us, TikTok TikToks work, influencers work, uh, you know, working with uh, YouTube works. YouTube's very visual, very big, you know. Instagram influencers were pretty big for us. But now, you know, it's getting more expensive. Uh, we need to, what we need to do is we need we usually try and find uh, thought leaders in a space and we identify people who we think are, are leaders within the cat uh, within certain niches. Right. So, for example, if we have somebody who is, say, uh, like a high school student. Right. And we and if this popular high school student has about 15,000 followers, we'll give them a watch and we'll send them two watches for free. And we'll say, look. Give them to anyone in your circle who you think, you know, would would uh, uh, represents the values of the brand. Mm -hmm. And and you, as you know, high school students are pretty viral, right? They look they are very aspirational, so they look up to like, oh, this person has a brand new award. Who else wants a brand new award, right? To so be creating a virality effect doing that. Sure, that's great. Uh, smart strategy. Um, all Thank right, you. and and uh, tell us a little bit about like. Um, as you were building this business, as you were scaling, your customers are coming in. What was the first biggest um, breakdown that happened? Was there any like where the customer, like you, you mentioned, some customer was not happy or whatever? Oh so, yeah, I had customer, okay. I had customer breakdowns from day one, man. Like I was the guy who was doing emails. I was like, when? So okay, so let me put it this way, right? It's this is these are the learnings I'm telling you now, and I seem like a saint. But when I started my business, I was not that. When I started, I was of course a typical business owner, which said. People want returns. Why do you want return? Why don't you show me this uh, picture of this product, man? Like, what's going on? Because I always thought the customer was out to, uh, was out to lie to you or something, right? Yeah. I didn't have the mentality of saying, let's look at this long term. And yeah. truly, it's my fault. It's like I, I looked at, I looked at things from a very myopic lens, not knowing that next door to me there's Amazon, which offers much better deals, uh, cheaper, uh, cheaper products, better prices, much better customer service any day of the week. Yeah. Right. So, so, and, so tell us about that. Like, how, I mean, that's a very important uh, topic you brought up. So, tell us about that experience and how did it? How did you actually shift your thinking? The the thinking process was simple. I mean, if I if I look at everybody, like even myself, like if if I'm going to Amazon looking for next delivery, looking for okay, so there's three things uh, which are you know uh, in a in a core value of pillars, right? So what, one of one of our key values is we want to have people who come into our store and they leave with a seamless customer experience. Right. So what that means is we are available 24-7, 365. We will, as a small company, match Amazon's customer experience and the Zappos customer experience as much as possible. Right. So Christmas Day, we are open. New Year's Day, we are open. We are open on, uh, you know, Diwali, Eid, uh, you know, uh, Ramadan. Don't care. We are open. Whenever you need us, we're going to be open for you. Right. You can come in 24-7, 365. We are always delivering value to you. Uh, you know. Uh, be, be at night, day, whatever. You can call us anytime you like and we'll always be there, right? That is something that I took from Amazon's book because I know for a fact that people love that about Amazon, right? People, the, the second thing we took from Amazon's book was no questions refund guarantee, right? If you think that this product doesn't fit with you and if you want, if you want to return it, you want a refund, we just don't ask questions, right? People want to have a seamless experience and you know who, who nickels and dimes you? People who are going to short charge you, people who are going to, people who don't seem trustworthy or illegitimate. If you're a big company, you're never going to short charge people. You're never going to nickel and dime people. All you're looking to do with those kind of people is you're looking to, uh, you know, you're looking, you're looking to create a very short term experience, like a sale, right? And like we were talking about earlier, is that people who live for price 
and sale are not going to succeed in the long run, right? And yeah. that's that's been the case with uh, a lot of big uh, shopping carts in India. Flipkart is still unprofitable for that matter. Uh, yeah. yeah, and the third thing that that I, that, I, that I firmly believe in is what is the value to, you're delivering to your customer, right? A customer's company is still looking for uh, a sense of fashion, a sense of flair. Everybody's unique. Everybody has their own uh, sort of uh, ideas of what they dress like, what they want to look like. So we have fashion stylists. You can WhatsApp. We can WhatsApp them. Tell them, hey, I'm wearing this, uh, these kind of clothes. What sort of watch does it go best with us? So we have personal stylists to communicate it to you. So those are the kind of things you know. We're personalizing the experience for each and every customer. We don't have a general statement on, and you know, we don't have templated emails that go to our customers. Awesome. So those are the things that I found that have. And when this happened, our sales started to skyrocket, right? So, yeah. So, so tell me about that. Like, what, uh, I mean, that was the question I asked earlier. Because when, when you said you were starting, you were asking all these questions. You're asking the, uh, the customer to send you photos and everything. How did it happen? Like, was there a particular incident? Was there a particular support request uh, which forced you to think differently? Or it happened gradually? It, it was an organic thing, right? It's honestly like, the, uh, like I can't tell you like one fine day I woke up and I had this like epiphany. It wasn't that all uh, Eureka movement. It was basically like uh, I started hanging out with our entrepreneurs who were in the e-commerce space, right? And, the, and from, 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 from the company that I kept, I started asking them, I, I started learning about like uh, product feedback, you know, how, what sort of strategies other, other people are using, what sort of, you know, uh, what sort of, uh, you know, feedback, feedback loop people are generating with the customers. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it. I had zero clue about it. But the pro and that's the best part about it. When you keep good company, all of a sudden these ideas start po uh, being populated. Like, so that saying is true. You know, you're a product of the company that you keep. Yeah, yeah, so true. Yeah, so true. yeah. I mean, this is uh, this is amazing. So, so thank you so much for sharing your journey so openly and honestly, and uh, you know, not not. Um, hiding beside uh, behind a facade so i mean that's uh, that's really unique uh, thank you so much uh, because yeah. that's what we try to do like you know peel the curtain a little bit uh, around the success story because a lot of people talk about success stories they do not talk about the work that goes behind that success so thank you so much for sharing that and i yeah, hope people that. people learn from this uh, experience of yours and uh, obviously we all make mistakes we learn but yeah, I mean, the, you keep good company, learn new things from people who have accomplished uh, bigger and better things. And, uh, and yeah, if, if you keep at it, things, uh, things turn around, yeah? Yeah, everybody expects entrepreneurship to be like an overnight success story, right? It's like uh, the, the blood, sweat, tears, and you know, the, most people write to, want to write your coattails. That, that's not a thing, that's not the way it happens. Yeah. Oh, awesome, that's great. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, now before I let you go, can you tell us how yes. people can reach out to you? Oh, they can reach out to me at ronnie at brandsia.com. That's my email. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Roaring Ronnie. Uh, I, I had Instagram. I deleted it. I'm afraid. You can uh, you can find me on LinkedIn if you want. Ronnie Tejas. My name, R-O-N-N-I-E-T-E-J-A. If you need anything, any help, I'm happy to help people. Awesome. Great. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank Thanks, you. buddy. Appreciate yeah. it. And that's all for now. Until next time. Now, if you're an entrepreneur or a career professional, then I invite you to join our growing community. Navigate to bootstrapping.group. As a welcome bonus, you will get the Startup Founders Technology Accelerator video series and Mastering Your Inner Game video series absolutely free. This series of short videos address some core issues which are instrumental in helping you move forward in your business or career. The videos are yours to view and share for free. No obligations or strings attached except for one, you have to take action and implement it. So join us today, navigate to bootstrapping.group. If you want more engaging videos and insightful interviews with industry's thought leaders, then check out the other videos we have picked for you. The link is right there. And if you want to be notified about our new content, please do consider subscribing to our channel.